All right. Okay, so some of you all may know that this speaker series is a new initiative for us at the Carpenters Boat Shop. This is our second evening. Um, and I just wanted to share with you all that on November 4th, we are gonna have our next guest speakers. They are gonna be Ben and Teresa Carey, uh, old friends of mine from the Hurricane Island Outward Bound School, but now they own a company called Morse Alpha and they teach sailing. It's a sailing school that is focused on passage making and safety at sea. So they will be joining us November 4th on a Thursday evening from seven to 8 p.m., similar to this format. So I'll just a shout out to folks that support us. Um, we are supported by many folks at, such as yourself. And what uh, I wanna share with you is that if you are so inclined, there is a link in the chat room. You can make a donation to us of any size and please know that no amount is too small. And Annie has shared in the chat room, a link for you all, if that feels like something you'd like to do this evening. In addition to that, there are many new faces here. Some of you all may have found us on Facebook or other social media platforms. But this evening, uh, tomorrow, I'm gonna choose randomly from an email that's been shared with us uh, via our website and or directly to me. And each month we're picking uh, a random email and the winner is gonna receive a beautiful shaker box that is handcrafted by one of our fabulous volunteers here at the boat shop. All right, so once we get started, you all, um, if you have any questions, we're gonna ask that you put your questions into the chat box. And at the end of the session, we're gonna make sure to leave time for Bobby uh, to be able to answer as many questions as he possibly can. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can directly talk to Annie or myself. And if you have any technical difficulties or questions, we're happy to answer them throughout this chat. Um, all right, so I am delighted that Bobby is here this evening to share with you and all of us the historical perspective on Monhegan Island, as well as the people that have called it home. As many of you know, Bobby is the founder of the Carpenters Boat Shop. He's a steadfast and active volunteer to many organizations, an exceptional human that is positive. <laughs> that is, <laughs> Bobby, you can't shake your head when I'm talking. <laughs> um, that has contributed positively to so, so many people. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, and in this moment, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Bobby. And thank you so much. Thanks everybody for being here. It's a delight to see all of your faces. Right, so Alicia, uh, do I this share screen now? That is correct. Sh share. Yeah. This meeting is recorded. Play. Yeah. Why? Nice Am I job. okay? Continue. It looks great. Okay. Am I, I'm okay? It says the host has spotlighted your video. So Annie, am I ready to go? Alicia, thanks so much for that very lovely and gracious uh, kind of invitation and um, announcement about this whole evening. Uh, bless your heart. It's just wonderful to be here. And it's like old home week to see all these faces. I haven't seen you in ages. So lovely to see you all, although I can't see you right now. I'm looking at Manhigan Island. So tonight, um, I'm gonna be speaking about a island I love so much and um, lived in for two years, but I should announce that um, tonight, we basically have two jobs to do. The first job is that I am to speak. The second job is that you are to listen. But if your job ends before my job, that's quite all right. Don't you worry. I mean, if you have to go see um, uh, Bill Bra uh, Brady and play football or do other types of things, that'll be quite all right. I will not be offended if you have to leave early. So again, you can leave at any single time. I'm an old gabber. I just keep going on and on. So if you have to chime out, please feel free to do it. 
So tonight, again, we're going to be speaking about this island you see before you, um, Manhigan Island. I'm a lover of islands, all islands. I have, in the um, 75 years that I've lived my life, I've lived on islands for eight different years, a little over eight years. So I've lived on, lived on Manhigan, of course, for two years. I lived on, uh-oh, let's see here. Can't seem to be moving something here. Why can't I? Alicia, I'm so sorry. Don't be sorry. Let's see if I can get out of this in some way. Oh, okay. I guess there we go. Am I still okay now? You're perfect. So I've lived in Manhattan for two years. I've lived over here. This is a Muscongas Island or Lowndes Island off around Pond for a couple of years. Uh, it's not working. Yeah. Let's see here. Let's see if I can escape. You are screen sharing. Stop sharing. Oh. There see. you go. Okay. Try to change it. There. All right. Maybe I can do it there. So anyway, um, lived on uh, Muscongas Island, lived on Matinicus Island, not a very good picture of it here, but I lived there for two summers as the minister of Matinicus. And folks and I actually lived on this island, like a very interesting island off the west coast of Scotland called Iona. We lived there for three months after I retired, and it was just a wonderful experience to be at the abbey <clears throat> in the cathedral there. But um, Manhigan, again, is my real love. I've, again, always adored this kind of place. And since I've loved these islands, I always love that wonderful poem by Rachel Field, the poem which goes, if once you have slept on an island, you'll never quite be the same. Oh, you may look as you looked the day before and go by the same old name, but you won't know when and you can't say how that change upon you came. But once you've slept on an island, you'll never quite be the same. So I've never quite been the same uh, because of all these wonderful islands and I adore them all. So it's a great joy to be able to speak about Menhagen here. But before I begin talking about the history and other aspects, let's begin with how you pronounce the word Monhegan Island because people pronounce it in all different kinds of ways and it's been spelled probably as many as 20 to 25 different ways. So if you are from the island, if you've been born there and raised there and kind of live there, you tend to say the word Monhigan, M-O-N-H-I-G-G-A-N. That's how it's kind of spelled. And that's the way they say it, Monhigan Island. If you come from off island, you tend to say Monhegan Island. And both are fine. They're both excellent. But if you look at really the etymology, etymology of the word and go back into the history, the earliest, again, Native American word from the Wabnaki tradition, their word for the island is Manchigan Island, Manchigan Island, which means the island furthest out. So the other interesting thing is that Captain John Smith, who comes there in 1614, 1615, in his log, he records it as Monaghan Island. So Monaghan and Munchigan sound a lot more like Monhegan Island rather than Monhegan Island. So again, it's whatever you would like to call it. That's again, the little history about it. But I tend to use the word Monhegan only because I love the people there so much and I have such an admiration and kind of a, again, a, just a deep love of the folk there. I tend to pronounce it the way they say it as a tribute and honor to all of those wonderful people. So Monhegan Island. So the island is here. As you can see, uh, is this okay to use this little red dot here? Does that work, uh, Alicia? I'm not seeing the red dot, Bobby. You don't see the red dot. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess it's not a part of the integration. Anyway, from, again, the, uh, the island is facing, of course, northeast by southwest, and the eastern seaboard that is in the foreground there, 
Again, are, are those wonderful high cliffs ranging anywhere from about 160 to 170 feet high. And then the island kind of diminishes over to the west side into more of a pastoral type of setting. So that the island probably when it was carved out, I mean, uh, probably 10,000 years ago when the ice age hit, it seemed to carve the entire coast of Maine kind of in a northeast by southwest fashion carving out the east side a little more dramatically. And then as it withdrew, it made a much more pastoral setting on the west side. And if you look at all the islands along the main coast, they're really much like that with a very precipitous side on the east and their more gentle side on the west. So here's the island, about a mile and a half long, about a half mile wide. Of course, Manana there off to the western and to the far distance there. And it's just a very stunning and very beautiful island. Oh, dear me. This is just, I don't seem to be able to control my, let me see if I can do something. How else can I do this? I can't seem to click this. Huh. Oh, dear. Maybe what you can do is try to do it by like remote control, but I don't, I've never done that before. Okay. What do I have here to, that I can do this? Uh, Bobby, an option is that Annie might be able to do it remotely for you. Oh, you want to try that? Let me. I'm going to have her try. It? She's going to give it a shot, Bobby. Okay. Gosh, it was working so well. Yeah, there we go. Let's go to that next one, the previous one, Annie. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, we'll try to do it as well as we can. Sorry for that little kind of inconvenience. So of, of course, here's the harbor of Manhagen, just a beautiful harbor off to the right is Manana Island. Off to the lower side there is Smutty Nose Island um, to the north. And of course, Manhagen is right to your left that way. So it's a beautiful harbor. Kind of, you feel like when you sail into it, a real sense of sanctuary, it kind of embraces you. But if the truth be known, it's actually a lousy harbor. It's a poor anchorage. Um, the lobster boats that are all there have moorings that are anywhere from three to 6,000 pounds of granite at the bottom there. People sail in, it's not a good place for holding an anchor. So it's a poor island, especially because it's open to the Northwest, it's open to the Southwest and open to the Northeast. So the winds are always blowing through that Harbor and the tide runs through anywhere from three to four knots. So a great looking Harbor, beautiful sanctuary, again, from viewing it, but a poor anchorage for any boats really coming into it. So we'll move on to the next photo, Annie. And of course, here is the east side. Uh, we'll go back a little bit, east side of the island. Can you back up just one more? Oh, there we go. So there's, uh, of course, uh, to the north east, that's uh, Blackhead Cliff, 170 feet to the water. To the left there is Squeaker Cove. And coming around the island, here we have Burnt Head, right? I mean, Whitehead Cliff, right here, another 170 feet to the water. Again, in the winter time when we lived out there, we would often come up there and we would be getting spray right over the island and even seaweed and a pot buoy was once discovered right up over that cliff. So it's a dramatic type of scene. And here is again, Gull Rock, 75 feet high. I have a picture of Gull Rock that a wave is literally burying the high, the actual rock. And then of course, off to the distance is Burnt Head Cliff. So it's a magnificent island. And not only is it a magnificent island because it was built that way, but also it's a magnificent island because of one person in particular. And that individual is Ted Edison. You see, Ted Edison and his family, actually Thomas Edison and his son, Ted, came to the island for vacations, but they came originally in 1910. And Ted was about 10 years of age at that time. And he just loved the island and just loved every bit of it. 
And so he, when he was about 25 to 30 years of age, came to the island and always came every single year. But when he was about 30, he actually bought a house out there on Burnt Head Cliff. It was a very stately house and he bought it. And the first thing that Ted Edison did with that house was to tear it down. He tore it down because he said that no one, no one should ever have exclusive rights to the beauty of this particular spot and this entire island. And so he tore it down so that everyone would be able to have access to that particular place. And then over the years, over 50, 60 years, Ted Edison bought almost every track of land as it came up for sale. And then he eventually owned probably as much as 65% of the entire island. But in 1957, he formed a group called the Manhigan Island Associates and he turned over the entire island to all the people of the island. And he turned it over to again, set the precedent so that everyone would be able to enjoy the beauty of Manhigan. And so everyone is able to do that through kind of this small kind of mini national park called Manhigan Island Associates. There's 12 miles of actual trails on the island, but the island is really preserved for in perpetuity, in, um, for posterity, so that everyone and anyone can come and enjoy the beauty of Manhigan Island itself. So Ted didn't tear down the entire house there uh, that was out on Burnt Head. This was one of the L's that was on the house and they actually dragged it from that particular house and dragged it right opposite the little church on the island. And this is now the parsonage uh, that he contributed <laughs> to the island people. And then Ted, oh, Andy, I'm gonna need help there. Ted actually ended up buying this house. It was owned by an artist named Andy Winter, but Ed, Ted and his wife, Ann bought this house. It's on the way up to, again, it's up to um, going up to Lighthouse Hill. Ruth and I actually live just above this house. We lived in the house just on the left, just before the lighthouse itself. So we always kind of pleased that we were able to look down on the Edison family. But also I love the fact that the Edisons, of course, um, father inventing the light bulb, but the <laughs> Ted and Ann Edison always lighted this house with not electric lamps, but with kerosene lamps itself. So here's the cemetery stone that is dedicated to them. They had their ashes put there in the cemetery. And this is the monument to both Ted and Ann Edison. But the history of the island again goes back literally uh, the earliest 10,000 years, 5,000, 10,000 years of the Wabnaki tradition. And literally hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of artifacts from the Wabnaki tradition, the early Native American tradition have been found all over that island. Arrowheads, spear shafts, all kinds of even hooks, as well as all of the, again, swordfish and oysters and clams that they dug in that island. But they are all there going back again, 10,000 years in terms of actual tradition. But in terms of, okay, uh, Annie, in terms of European tradition coming to the island, probably the earliest thing that we know of is this actual little rock here. It's a petrograph, not on Manhigan, but over on Manana Island. It's a petrograph that is about six inches high. I wish I had my pointer. I can't believe I don't, I'm not able to do this, but it's about six inches high, six feet long. And it, um, it is a petrograph that is believed to be a Viking in its origin in that way. Again, even again, Captain John uh, Smith, when he came in 1614, he notes this actual petrograph in his ship's log, and he believed it was Viking as well. And indeed, as probably many of you know, one of the earliest artifacts on the main coast in terms of European tradition was a coin that was discovered in Blue Hill, Maine, even I think it was in the 1960s, but it was a coin that was attributed to the Vikings themselves. And of course they were in Newfoundland at Lansom Meadows there and came down into Nova Scotia and is believed that came down into Maine as well. 
that is the actual petrograph there. And that is a rubbing of the petrograph, which again, most people feel is Viking, although some scholars actually felt it was Phoenician in its origins. In any event, the individuals who have come to the island are numerous, starting 1595 with John Cabot coming there. John Cabot came from Bristol, England, sails the ship Matthew, comes into this region according to a ship's log, looking for all kinds of economic gain, natural resources, fish, etc., and also looking for the Northwest Passage. But then 1603, Martin Pring, an individual who knew John Cabot, came from Bristol, England, also sails down there, looking and charting the same kinds of things, natural resources, looking for the Northwest Passage to the Orient and everything. Well, we're having a little more problem here. Okay, let's see. In any event, oh, here we are, so, sorry. In any event, and then 1605, George, or 1604, Samuel de Champlain sails up from the south, again, goes and stays there, calls the island Isla Ho. We do have an Isla Ho, of course, in Penobscot Bay, but Samuel Champlain also named this the High Island Isla Ho as well. Again, go, of course, going up to 180 feet in, in terms of height. But um, Samuel de Champlain eventually sails through, goes up to the Bay of um, uh, St. Lawrence, and eventually, is, eventually becomes the founder, of course, of Quebec. George Weymouth, 1605, comes through. Uh, Weymouth is sailing the Archangel, comes to Manhigan Island, then goes to Allen's Island, and is attributed to having the first Anglican church service in North America there on Allen's Island. Although, if you go to St. John of the Divine, there's a big plaque there that says that the first Anglican church service in North America was actually on Manhigan Island but probably most scholars feel it was on Allen's Island. And there's that big monument saying Weymouth 1605 uh, to him there. Captain John Smith comes 1614, spends the whole summer as well as the summer of 1615. He has gardens there. His lo ship's log says that he was growing salad herbs as well as catching fish and charting the entire area. And even the pilgrims, 1622, come Edward Winslow, William Bradford, the two leaders, come to Manhigan Island. Why? Well, we all know they come in 1620 to Plymouth. They, of course, after the first winter, 103 passengers, over half of them had perished and died because of malnutrition, the hard conditions, but they come looking for other types of food to be able to sustain themselves. And it's to Manhigan that they come. So let's, uh, Annie, if we can move on. So that's the door to go there, but the very first house that is on Manhigan Island is this one in particular. Again, it was um, uh, back in 19, 19, back in 1777. The island was sold by Benjamin Bickford to a man named William Trefetheren. And William Trefetheren and Jemima Trefetheren were living down near uh, the border of New Hampshire. They then bought the island, the entire island, for 300 pounds. And in 1780, probably about 82, 83, they moved to Manhigan Island. And this is the house that they built, about, nine, about 1783. In any event, they build this house. They have two children, William Trefetheren Jr. and Mary. and the second oldest house on the island is this one called the 1784 house. It's again built in 1784 by Josiah Starling, who marries Mary Trefetheren, the daughter there. And together they have a number of children. The oldest or the firstborn child is Phoebe Starling. And the second daughter is Mary Starling. Why do I mention them? Because the two oldest tombstones in the Manhigan Island, Step, Manhigan Island Cemetery are dedicated to those two daughters. Again, to Phoebe, who died at two and a half months, and Mary Trefeather, who dies when she's two and a half years old. Again, kind of a barometer of the, <clears throat> of the harsh conditions, the hard times, and even back then and even to this day. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Annie. 
Uh, the third oldest house is this one. It's called the Influence. It was built by Williams, again, Trefetheran Jr. They, he and his wife had uh, six children. And it's referred to as the Influence principally because it's believed that uh, William Trefetheran wanted to try to influence the architecture on the island to have it dignified and very stately. The real, I think, tradition is that it is of a bad influence to the people because in the mid 19th century, the mid 1800s, it became known as a place of ill repute, a place of drinking and carousing, and so is also a bad influence. So whether it's good or bad, it still bears the name, the influence. The next uh, slide here, uh, although those are the three oldest dwellings on the island, here actually are the oldest houses on the island. They're the fish houses. These fish houses go back to 1780s. Again, they were built by the Trefetherans and the, again, the uh, Starlings, as well as the Horns or Orns as it's pronounced out there. But those are the three earliest families and these are the oldest actual fish houses on the island back to the 1780s. If I could point by that red kayak, there used to be a fish house right there. And in 1978, that huge storm that swept the coast of Maine, that fish house was there. It was a Trefetheran fish house. Shermie Stanley was uh, filling his bait bags on that particular day when the storm came through. Suddenly, a wave literally buried that actual fish house and dragged it halfway down the beach. Shermie ran out of the fish house, ran up the beach only to see a wave just curling over that fish house smashed it to smithereens and took it out to sea, never to be seen again. So again, that fish house was there for 200 years, but wiped away in 1978 after 200 years. So let's keep on going. So the fish houses are the oldest and there's still about five fish houses there built in the 1700s. And I put that picture up there for you to have you take note of the little skips that are there because all of them were built by an organization called the Carpenter's Boat Shop. So here's another uh, wonderful kind of house that's out there built in 1824. Of course, the light and the lighthouse, second highest light on the coast of Maine, Seguin being the highest at 178 feet. But the lighthouse is such a dignified and wonderful building and is now serving, of course, as the Fisherman's Museum. Moving on to another interesting building, not on Menhagen Island, but this dwelling was built in 1854 and it's the fog signal station over on Manana Island. This is how it looked over eventually the years. Bogdanov painted this picture probably about 1940s in that time frame. But I would ask you to take a note of that little bell that's over there because that was the first fog signal. It was a person having to go out and whenever it was foggy, ringing that manually. And that bell that you saw up here next to the museum was uh, when we were living there, transported in 1974 by, a, again, a Coast Guard helicopter, and they flew it and brought it in, and now it permanently sets right there next to the Fisherman's Museum. Moving on, uh, of course, to some other architecture on the island. Uh, this is, of course, the Island Inn. But the reason I show you this is because it was built by a very amazing man. His name was Will Stanley Jr. Will Stanley Jr. came to the island in 1884. He came with his father, Will Stanley Sr., who came as the lighthouse keeper on Menhagen from Mount Desert Island. But in 1885, Will Stanley Sr. sent his son back to Mount Desert Island. Why? because he wanted him to be a carpenter, and not just an ordinary carpenter, but a wonderfully good carpenter. And he sent him back, of course, to Mount Desert Island because Mount Desert Island was going through a tremendous boom of a lot of cottages being built in the Bar Harbor area. The Carnegie's, the, again, Rockefellers. Uh, no, let me see here. The, Anyway, uh, all of the different individuals, yeah, Rockefellers, and many of the very established families were building these kind of 34, 54 room cottages there in Bar Harbor. Sadly, most of them burned in 1947. 
But in any event, Will Stanley was there for 10 years learning the carpentry trade and in 1894 comes back to Manhagen to begin a building spree for the people of Manhagen. Again, the island is in is but one of the houses or hotels that he built, but he built over 30 five different cottages and houses on the island. So he's probably the preeminent carpenter on the island through its history. But he also builds, would you now shift me? Uh, this is a painting of uh, called Skiffs at Church. And uh, this is a boat that actually Will Stanley created. Before 18, about, probably around 1900, before that time, all the fishermen used to go to their boats in scows or ponds or small dories. But Will Stanley Jr. designed this particular boat for the fishermen to be able to carry two fishermen and a barrel of bait out to the actual water. And of course, this is how the Manhigan people use those boats at the present time. They row them out to their lobster boats, they bring back and they then drag them up to their fish houses and go down. But again, this is the boat that Will Stanley Jr. designed, and it is the boat that the boat shop has been building for the fishermen now for 42 years. So the question is, how did Ruth and I get to the island? Well, in 1973, Ruth was a very close friend of a minister of the Sunbeam, uh, the Maine Seacoast Mission, which provides ministry to the people of the offshore islands. But she was a good friend of the boat minister, a man named Stan Haskell. And Stan Haskell told her about a job that had come up that he had seen on Manhigan Island, a job looking for a minister and a teacher. Well, Ruth had always wanted to be a teacher on an island, so we actually applied. And lo and behold, we got the job and we became the ministers of the Little Island Church and the teachers of the one-room schoolhouse there. And uh, it was just a, an extraordinary experience. It's not a very good picture, but here are all our children. It was a one-room schoolhouse, of course. We had 14 children between kindergarten and eighth grade, one or two in every single grade. So it was just a wonderful experience. And I'm very proud to be able to say that of those 14 children over the years, I've been able to perform the marriages of nine of the different children. So when we moved on to the island, um, this was the house we live in. It was a magnificent house. Um, again, it was called the Bessie Greenhouse. It looked right out over all of Muscongas Bay and Pemaquid Point, but it did have three kind of deficits. You see, it, um, it didn't have, of course, any running water, didn't have any electricity, and it also didn't have any insulation whatsoever. It was built as a cottage. So this was, quote, the teacherage that we had to live in. And indeed, in the back corner there, we just kind of lived in two little rooms. And we always thought we were really doing well during the winter time, from about mid-December to mid-March. We thought we were doing well if we could get the house up to about 50 or 55 degrees tops. And indeed, that's how uh, Ruth lived. Um, whenever she'd come back from uh, school, she'd wrap herself in that quilt. She used to put a star stocking cap on and then always putting her feet in the oven. Indeed, that little, you can see the, the end of the stove there, that was our sole source of heat. It was a little kind of wick burner, two wick burners there. And so it, it really didn't give us too much. And in fact, one evening, the actual kerosene uh, pipeline froze so that in the morning our house was about 20 degrees. <laughs> it was a rough existence. We'll carry on. Okay, so here are the children there. They're just delightful people from the right to the left. That's Zoe. Uh, she uh, now, th this picture again is back in 1973. And so these uh, children are now about 50 to 55 years of age. And Zoe has fished on the island for a considerable time. She's now a boat captain down in Florida. Chris, the next tall boy, is a fisherman out of a huge dragger down in Galilee, Rhode Island. The next boy is, uh, again, Courtney, who's a sea captain down in Florida also. And Donna Cundy in between them is the only person in that picture who still resides on the island. And Don is the assistant teacher of the school. So she's been doing that for almost 40 years. <laughs> we'll move on. So when we first arrived on the island, we realized that we had a very serious problem. 
the problem was that um, the children spoke, you can't believe this, they spoke with such disparaging tones about the people from Matinicus Island. It was amazing. They'd say things like, oh, you can't trust those people from Matinicus. They're a bad lot. You know, they fish off our bat side and they, they just can't, they can't be trusted in any kind of way. So we realized, my gosh, we have this serious problem. We've got to nip this in the bud. So I quickly wrote, wrote over to Jean Tapley, the one room school teacher on Matinicus. And I said, Jean, we've got this serious problem. Can you help us? I said, would you ever have your children send to our children letters? Matinicus had about 11 children at that time. And um, I said, here are the ages and the names of all of our children. If they could write to our children, maybe we can reduce this kind of friction between us and thee. So in any event, uh, Jean had her children write to all of our kids. They had pictures in them and pictures of houses and boats. And when our children received those letters, I mean, they were ecstatic. They just loved the letters. They said, my gosh, look, that man's boat is just like ours. That person's house is just like ours. And they started writing letters back to the Matinicus kids. Well, they did it all year long. And then I went to Stan Haskell next, again, who was the boat minister on the Sunbeam. And I asked if he would ever bring all the Matinicus kids for a weekend over to Manhigan. He very gladly said he would be delighted to do it and did it. And here they are arriving on Monhegan Island, and we had the best time ever. We had games and a dance and all kinds of treasure hunts and activities. And then the following year, we went back to Matinicus. So it was just a wonderful experience. And indeed, suddenly the whole notion of ill will towards Matinicus was totally done away with. And one of my very proud moments in life also was when I performed the wedding of my sixth and seventh grade student named Kelly Cundy. And when I was there at the wedding, who should turn up but Kelly Cundy's maid of honor? Who was she? She was Ellen Bunker, her pen pal relationship from the Tinnicus Island. So now there are bridges of peace that have been built between them. So the island has so many interesting people. It's amazing. Uh, here is uh, Charlie Murphy. He's about 103 years of age there. He fished up until he was about 94 or 95. But Charlie Murphy holds the distinction of having license number one, lobster license number one. It seems he learned that you had to get a license. Of course, he grumbled about it back in 1906 when they were first issued. But when he was in Rockland one day, he thought, oh, you know, you got to get a license. So I might as well go try to find it. He went to the Department of Marine Resources or whatever it was called back then, filled out an application and they gave him license number one. For 30 years, he held it, but then he became a shepherd over on Harbor Island in the middle of Muscongas Bay. And uh, he was a shepherd for three years. His license lapsed. He went back to Rockland to renew it. He went in and said, I needed my license. Uh, they said, okay, fill out the form. And they gave him license number 5,600 and something. He said, no, 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 no. My license is number one. I want number one. They said, no, no, no. That license lapsed. We've given it to another person. You'll have to have this other license. He said, no, look, I branded all my traps. I've gotten all my buoys branded with number one. I need number one back. They said, we'll think about it. And indeed they did. And after thinking a short while, they gave Charlie Murphy 1A. Not only was he the first to get number one, but he was the first to get a letter after his actual number. And the amazing thing, is that 1A is still in that family after six generations. <laughs> Here are the two storekeepers on the island, Doug and Harry Odom. They kept the store there for 52 years. Sadly, they started, uh, I guess, the store back in the 40s. But in 1963, one week before John Kennedy was shot, sadly, their generator caught fire, burned the entire store, and burned seven different houses on the island. It was headed for the entire island, but fortunately the wind shifted and went back towards the harbor so that only seven houses in the store were burned. 
But when in true Menhagen fashion, the people of the island kind of rallied round, they gave Doug and Harry money and supplies, and indeed they were able to, moving on Annie, build their brand new store, which again, they ran again for the 52 year period. But the island is always watching out for the common good of one another in that way. Here's another very interesting individual. I'm sure many of you have heard about him or seen him. Uh, Ray Phillips didn't live on Manhattan, but lived over on Manana Island. So Ray Phillips came to the island about the 1930s. He originally actually came from Newport, Maine, went to the University of Maine, got a degree there, uh, was in World War I. Then afterwards, he went down to be a fisherman on Long Island and do a number of different jobs. But in 19, I guess about 1931, Ray went to Cape Cod, bought a boat there and sailed to New Harbor, Maine. He stayed in New Harbor for the entire summer, loved it, but was always inquiring of the fishermen. What's that island offshore there? What's that island? He said, oh, that's Menhagen Island. So the next summer he came back, stayed a week in New Harbor, but then went out and indeed went to anchor right there by Manana Island, stayed on his boat, but began building a house on the island. Now, I wish I had my, again, little thing there, but uh, the house that he built was not this entire complex. It was the one on the far upper right hand side. And he built it in an amazing way. He again, he built that house. Again, he took the land by squatters rights and just built the house out of driftwood and any wood he could kind of, again, get in any way. And he built from the ridgepole a house that was about 10 by 15 in size. Then from the same ridgepole, he built another house about 18 by 22 in size. And he lived on the inner kingdom and his sheep lived on the outer kingdom. And that's how he heated his house, strictly by sheep power. It's amazing how much heat is generated from three to five inches of sheep dung, which was all around the outer house. And I must say, having visited Ray on a regular basis, it was also on his inner kingdom as well. But that's how he kind of led his life, living there all by himself on Manana Island. A real character, a very friendly figure. He was a hermit, but he would play chess with people and share news with people. He made his living by cutting the wool and selling the wool and also lobster fishing. But Ray, around 19, I guess, 1948 or something, an AP photographer came out to the island. And he saw Ray and took his picture. And uh, the picture went out over AP Press with a little article about Ray. And suddenly people literally from all over the world started writing to Ray Phillips there on Manana Island. He was such an iconic figure. And they wrote to him, but Ray had no stationery. So what Ray would do is if you wrote him a letter, he would then take your letter and interpolate the letter. He would write between the lines, scrubbing out his name, writing in your name, and then he would write a little letter to you and sign it, your friend, Ray Phillips, take your envelope, turn it inside out, and then readdress it to you, and you would get the letter back in about two or three weeks. If you sent him a card of some kind, a Christmas card, a Hanukkah card, whatever card, you would get that same card back the following year. His name scrubbed out, your name written in. So it's kind of a big circular file for Ray Phillips on a regular basis. So Ray, um, again, lived there all his life. Um, but when he was about 84, one week around the end of March 1975, he came across, as he did once a week, to Manhagen, got his mail, got his um, supplies, rode back to Manana. But sadly, as he was getting out of his skiff, he slipped on ice or seaweed or something and went right into the water. He struggled to get out. He was able to get out part way, but he was in the water for about a half an hour. Again, his legs in the water before one of the fishermen saw him, came around and got him out, got him up to his house. But sadly, Ray at that point began to go down very quickly, probably got pneumonia. Number of us went over to try to persuade him to come over to Manhagen to again, recuperate there and then go back to Manana. But he would have nothing to do with that. No, he said, no, I'm not leaving. I'll be fine. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. In fact, what I'll do is I will take 
a kerosene lamp and put it in my window when it gets dark every night. And when it comes on, you'll know that all is well at Manana and all is well with Ray Phillips. And indeed that light did come on. It came on for about two or three weeks, but then one evening it didn't come on and we went over and Ray had died, of course. But we were all very grateful that at least Ray died and as he lived with a great amount of dignity and integrity and the way they truly wanted to live his life. After he died, uh, we had a service in the church for Ray. About 250 people came to that church service. Only 100 people can fit in the church. But in any event, about 250 people came from all over to pay tribute to him. But I think the finest tribute that was paid to Ray is this picture here. It, of course, was uh, painted by Jamie Wyatt. He painted about two or three months after Ray died, and it's a tribute to Ray. Of course, there's Manana Island there. That's one of Ray's rams that is there. But he painted it really as if it were Ray Phillips himself, painting it with the dignity and the honor and the simplicity with which Ray lived his life there on Manana itself. And we put a small tombstone up for Ray and simply just said, Ray Phillips, shepherd, shepherd, of Manana Island. So um, Ray died again in 1975, but about six months later, another person actually moved into Ray's house. It was a man from the island named Danny Bates. And Danny Bates decided that he would take over and be the new Ray Phillips. He moved into the house with his girlfriend, Amy Mellenbacher. And together they shoveled out all the sheep manure, they put in new windows, they boarded it up and together they began living on Manana. They had two children. The first one was called Orca, and the second child was a little girl named Kila. So they raised the children on the island, but sadly a few years into it, um, uh, Amy developed a parasite in her eye, probably from the sheep dung. And so she went blind in one eye and eventually left the island. So at that point, uh, Danny decided to build a new house. And that's what the house up on the upper side there was, Danny's new house. And indeed, he had a new partner at that time. They too had a couple of children. So the children were raised there on Manana Island. They didn't go to school formally over on Manhigan, that they were raised and self-educated as well as educated by the family there. And indeed, Orca, when he was about 13 or 14 years of age, um, Jamie Wyatt took a real interest in Orca. For Jamie, Orca being raised on the island, being schooled on the island, and indeed kind of being that free figure, uh, independent of all kinds of schooling and culture, for Jamie, he became the very essence of the island spirit. Again, he was at one with nature there. He was an individual who was kind of the prototype, the primordial type of individual. So he kind of paints him in that way uh, as this individual who's a true islander with that island independent spirit. I think that as I really look through those paintings, I also see another individual in them. And that is Jamie Wyeth himself. You see, Jamie, of course, has had no formal education. He has had no public schooling whatsoever. His father, Andrew Wyeth, tutored him. He also was tutored by other artists, but that is all. He was a free spirit, and indeed, Jamie himself has lived on islands much of his life by himself, very much so. So again, as you look at Orca, I think you're also looking a lot at the spirit of Jamie coming through. And speaking about Jamie, of course, the art tradition runs long and strong through the history of the island. Artists begin arriving in the 1870s, but the person who really develops the art tradition on the island, and indeed to this day, probably of the 750 people who go there in the summertime, I would say about 200 of them are artists. But the tradition really begins with this person here named Robert Henry, and that is one of his pictures. And Robert Henry was um, the founder of the Ashcan School of Art in Manhattan. He had many students and pupils, and starting around 1900, Henry comes to the island with many of his pupils and students. 
one of which in 1905 was a man named Rockwell Kent. Kent loves the island, is just enthralled with Monhegan Island. He not only continues to paint for 50 years on the island, but he becomes a carpenter there. He also lobster fishes there and does all kinds of activities. He stays off and on, but for over 50 years, Rockwell Kent stayed on the island. This was the house that he built for himself. It is down at Lobster Cove. He built it about uh, 1925 in that time frame, and he lived in it until about 1957. His heirs had it after that, but in 1968, Jamie Wyeth bought it. And that has been Jamie's house ever since that time. He's been there for well over 50 years. Jamie stays there in the summertime up until October and then moves over to Southern Island in Tenet's Harbor for the winter where he does his very serious painting there in the lighthouse on, on uh, again, Southern Island in Tenet's Harbor. There are so many other islands that Henry is responsible for though, with George Bellows, the famous painter comes for five different summers. Edward Hopper also five or six different summers, paints extensively all over the island. There it is at Blackhead. And of course the Wyeth tradition runs long and strong through the island's history. There's Manhagen of course in the background, but Noel Converse Wyeth, N.C. Wyeth, paints extensively from the 30s to the 40s. Then of course his son, Andrew Wyeth, also paints extensively on the island. And now Jamie has been living there of course for over 50 years. Here's a picture again of another important institution, the library. It's called the, again, the um, Edward and Jackie Memorial Library. Edward and Jackie were two school children who were there. And uh, sadly in 1928, there was a party, a birthday party for all of the school children down in Squeaker Cove. As they were celebrating, a huge wave came in and washed Jackie and Edward into the water and they drowned at that point. And the village decided to, as a memorial to those chill children, build this particular, particular uh, uh, library for those children in their memory. And that is a, a, just a beautiful library and meeting place for the people ever since. Probably the tradition though, that is one of the most important is of course, this one right here, lobster fishing. Again, they have fished for 200 years on the island, but lobster fishing became very prominent in the early, again, early 1900s. And in 1907, they imposed upon themselves through a state law that the island fishermen, since they wanted to be environmentalists, they wanted to always make sure there was enough lobsters to be able to live on that island. So they imposed on themselves a special law which said that they would only fish to a two mile radius around the island and that they would only fish for six months of the year. Now they've imposed another uh, law and that is they will only fish 400 traps. But because they fish only six months of the year, they always begin together. It was, it used to be on January 1st to June 25th, it's shifted a little bit. But usually on January 1st, that was declared as trap day. But it wasn't necessarily always on January 1st. It was only when all the fishermen were ready to go. If someone had an illness or their boat wasn't ready, they would postpone trap day. But once everyone was ready to go and healthy, they would declare trap day. And on that morning, the head fishermen would drop a buoy overboard so that they could all go out equally and fish the grounds. Likewise, if any fisherman becomes ill, breaks an arm, all the fishermen will haul that person's traps, giving him all the proceeds. The people might not like the individual whom they're doing it for, they might even hate him, but they do it, serving the common good, helping one another to serve the common good of the island people and the island itself. And I have just one last story I really would like to share with you because it also, for me, captures the very essence of the island and the island people. And this story is uh, dated, uh, it starts on January 22nd, 1986. January 22nd, 1986. This, of course, is Manana Island. It's the, again, the little boathouse there on Manana that the Coast Guard men 
use, even though they live on Manana, they of course have to go over to Manhagen. And it's this little pea pod you see right there that they go over to the island in. Well, on January 22nd, at 2 a.m. in the morning, the Coast Guard station in Booth Bay Harbor called the Manana Coast Guard station and said, you must go immediately over to Manhagen Island. The light has gone out. You must get that light going now. Get over there quickly. The two men did just what they said. They got their oil skins on. They traveled all the way down to that little boathouse, jumped in the pea pod, and pulled the lever to go down that actual gangway. As it went down, the important thing to remember is it's January 22nd. It was about 10 degrees. It was blowing about 30 knots. Again, it was pitch black. As they released the lever, they skiff, the pea pod went roaring down that gangway, and as it hit the water, it flipped right over, just casting these two Coast Guard people right into the water. This is, this is the station. You can just see where that is there, but they went into the water right there by Manana Island. They were literally in the water for about 10 minutes. You have about 15 minutes to live, but they finally were able to make their way over to right there at the bottom. They were able to make their way onto Smutty Nose Island. But as they came up on that island, they were literally freezing to death, just freezing to death. Fortunately, one of the Coast Guard men had a VHF radio that was waterproof, and he quickly called over to Booth Bay Harbor Coast Guard Station and shouted, we're dying, we're dying, we need help immediately. The people in Booth Bay Harbor were just devastated. I mean, there was no way, they knew there was no way they could ever get over to save the men's lives. They quickly called Sherm Stanley, the head fisherman of Manhagen, and pleaded with Sherm to see what he could do to get over to the island to save the men. Sherm just quickly went and got another one of the fishermen, Steve, again, Rollins. The, together, they went down to Fish Beach right there on the left-hand side, the Fish Beach. They tried to get their skiff off, but to no avail. I mean, it was too windy. The waves were too heavy. But Steve remembered there was a dory behind his fish house, an 18-foot dory. They grabbed the dory. They brought it down to the beach. They pulled with all their might, literally, for almost 20, 25 minutes made it over to Smutty Nose only to see that the two men had passed out or were probably dead. They threw him in the dory anyway. They simply rowed back to the island, got him up to a house, and in doing it, were able to revive them and save their lives. The highest award, I mean, the highest award the Coast Guard gives out is the Silver Star Award, only for personal bravery. And indeed, the Washington office called Steve and Sherm down to Washington to receive that amazing Silver Star Award for personal bravery and heroism in saving those two men's lives. So of course, why do I share that story? Well, for me, again, it's the essence of the island, always watching out for one another, always showing that courage and that bravery. But why I also share it is because that dory they used to save those men's lives, that dory was built by the Carpenter's Boat Shop. So thank you so much. Thank you for letting me share some of these stories and uh, these remembrances and uh, wonderful times we had on that very beloved island. Oh, Bobby, so fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry was... about the, the clicker and everything. It would have gone a little faster, I think, if we had that. <laughs> Absolutely, no, no worries whatsoever. Um, I do have a question for you, Bobby. I have two questions for you. Okay. Uh, the first one is, do you know what the current population of the island is today? Uh, yes. Uh, the island population kind of ebbs and floods. It's down to about 60 people. When we were there, it was 75 people, but it's down to 60 people. And sadly, when we were there, there were about 15 fishermen. Now they're down to about 10 fishermen who are fishing the waters out there. Oh. I think there are about five children in the school at the present time. Wow. And Bobby, how many Sherm Stanleys are there or have <laughs> there been? <laughs> well, again, they go back to again to 1884. So, uh, but they're now on their seventh generation. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, they're, and the young, actually, 
uh, Sherm Stanley, and then there's Shermie Stanley, and uh, now there's Dwight Stanley. Uh, Dwight actually chose not to be a fisherman. Uh, he's an oral surgeon <laughs> at the present time, but he has a son, and there's hopes that he might be a fisherman as well. <laughs> Right. Uh, another question for you, Bobby, is how long did you live on the island and what did you what do you miss most about being there? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> so we um, Ruth and I lived there for two years. We also then returned the next year to to the actually the third year after that. Of, we were replaced by another preacher teacher, as they called us, uh, but they didn't uh, last very long. And so they asked us to come back to the island. And Ruth and I did go back there uh, for four days every month to visit with the people and to have a church service there and to be with the folk. And we did that for an entire year. But um, so we were there probably off and on for at least two and a half, maybe three years uh, on the island. What do I miss the most? Um, I just can't tell you enough how much I love the people out there. They're just such dear people. They work so hard. It's a, a very interesting kind of island community. But I especially miss the um, older fishermen who we were with in the 1970s. And I've had to do many, many of their funerals. In fact, I just did a year ago, Sherm Stanley's funeral and related some of these stories to the congregation as we were all gathered in the little church that way. So um, it's the people I've always missed. But I mean, of course, it's such a magnificent island. You can't help but love the beauty of that place. Bobby, do you mind share, sharing the story of how you started building the Monhegan skiffs at the Carpenter's Boat Shop? Not at all. <clears throat> so um, when we started the Carpenter's Boat Shop, about probably a literally about two or three months after we started it. Uh, the last of the boat builders out there was another Stanley. I mean, the Stanley family is the kind of a prominent family of the island, but Ronnie Stanley was the last of the boat builders. Ronnie built for probably about maybe 30 years, 35 years or so, but sadly uh, he had diabetes and he went blind, so he couldn't build the Manhigan Island skiff gave me a call and said, would I ever, I heard that I was going and doing boat building and working with young people. He said, would you ever take on the tradition of building the Manhagen Island skiff for the fishermen? And I said, Ronnie, I would be so honored to do that. It would just be wonderful. So I went out and I got his bevel board, which is uh, in his molds and uh, again, a pattern over the actual skiff side. And I took it away and I, I saw how he had built his actual skiffs and I pretty much did it exactly the way he was doing it, but with his moles, with his again, bevel board. And again, for now 42 years, we've been building that exact same boat. We make little variations, nothing very dramatically, but again, often fishermen will make different recommendations. I mean, they want the lightest boat possible, the toughest boat possible, and a boat that's gonna be able to carry two people and a barrel of bait. So um, it's gonna get a lot of rugged use. So um, we've changed it to toughen it up, to lighten it up and to make it as strong and as seaworthy as possible. But those are the only changes. Basically, you know, what you saw at that little picture, that painting that calls skiffs at church, that was as close to really, uh, again, Will Stanley Jr.'s boat as any there is. It has varied. Will Stanley Jr. built it out of pine, actually. Uh, there were a number of small changes that way. Ronnie built it out of plywood because it became a lot lighter. So we tend to make the sides plywood to make it light, but the cedar bottom on it and as tough as possible through the breast hook and the quarter knees and all the ribs. So that's pretty much how we got it. And again, it's always fun to go out there and to see the little collection. And uh, it's like looking at your children as I go down Fish Beach to see all those little boats all along the shore. That's fantastic. All right, Bobby, I'm going to ask you one more question. Sure. Um, will you talk a little bit about how the Islanders got along with the artist? Good question. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be surprised by this or not, but they got along remarkably well. In fact, it was a very tight community in that way. 
And I think the reason why it was is because the artists, when they came onto the island, they had such a deep, deep appreciation for the fishermen, how hard they worked and the conditions that they fished from January 1st to June 25th. And so most every artist just truly admired all of those fishermen and they became very, very good friends. If you actually go into the fishermen's houses, you will see probably the finest art galleries you can imagine. There is the art gallery now for all of the historic painters there, but the finest collections are in the houses of the fishermen. Why? Because when the artists painted them, they often would give the fishermen different paintings of themselves or in tribute to those individuals. So in the island houses are all these wonderful pictures of the fishermen. And because the, again, painters and artists had such an appreciation for the fishermen, the fishermen in turn had a deep respect and appreciation for the artist. So it's an amazing kind of symbiotic relationship between those two groups of people, one kind of admiring and one paying tribute to the other in that way. Again, I don't wanna be disparaging like my school children, but if you do go to Matinicus Island, you will notice that there are 17 individual wharves on that island. Whereas on Manhigan, there is one common wharf that they use and fish from. And the 17 wharves over on Matinicus are because they don't have that input of a lot of people coming in and working with them, sharing with them to kind of help bringing a sense of friendship and more kind of integration of life there. They tend to turn away from each other and are very individually oriented. I remember one of the pen pal relationship letters that came across in 1974 was that my dad was shot the other day by his neighbor. Well, uh, sadly, those 17 wharves represent a lot of isolation as well. Whereas here, it's a very meaningful place where there is a lot of integration with the summer people, the artists and the year rounders. So yes, it's a very, I think it's a very, well, home knit spun island that respects one another along that line because of the art community. Bobby, uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, gratitude coming from all of these screens and a thankfulness for your taking the time to be with us this evening, the fantastic stories the history. And uh, Annie and I also want to just say thank you so much for being here, taking the time and having an outstanding Monhegan presentation. Thank you so much. Alicia, thank you so much for this opportunity. Blessings on you all. Lovely to see you all. Special blessings. Good night for now. Good night, Bobby. <laughs>